Hello, everybody. Sorry for starting a little bit late. Uh, we're going to start our next session, Autonomous TCP Offload. Uh, clever mechanisms to make the offload only be the relevant portions, not everything together. Uh, Boris is going to be our speaker, and uh, we're going to first play a video. When the video ends, we'll do the question and answer session. In the meantime, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A tab. If you have an emergency question that you just can't hold on to, raise your hand and we'll see if we can address that. So without further ado, here we go. Hi everyone, my name is Boris Vismani and today I'm going to talk to you about our work, Autonomous NVMe TCP offload. This is joint work with Yulai Zak, Ben Benishai, and Ol Gerlitz. Uh, this talk describes a work on floating storage protocols, and uh, we present NVMe TCP offload as a leading example, but the ideas we present here are more general and can be applied to additional protocols. So uh, we're going to start for some uh, motivation uh, about why do we need uh, this offload, then describe how we offload storage protocols uh, and its seamless integration into the network and storage stacks, and finally, we'll describe the API and its implementation in the Linux kernel. Uh, so there are several offload opportunities when considering storage protocols. Uh, the first two are uh, related to checksum offloading. So uh, storage protocols use application layer checksums uh, that are usually present at the uh, uh, trailer of the PDU. And so on transmit, we can offload its calculation and receive its verification. Additionally, uh, storage protocols require uh, copying data from TCP packets to destination buffers. A destination buffer can reside uh, even in user space, and so it's particularly challenging. Uh, as TCP receives data in anonymous unaligned buffers, and these buffers also contain uh, protocol metadata handles that should not uh, reside in the destination buffers. And as a result, storage stacks opt to copy data from uh, TCP packets to destination buffers. Uh, now, to further motivate uh, this work, we uh, performed a cycle breakdown of the copy and CLC operations. And we, we measured the uh, cycles of uh, FIO using a single call with uh, small uh, blocks of 4K and large blocks of 256 kilobytes. And we valid the uh, queue's depth, uh, increasing it from 1 to 4K. Uh, and what we see in the figure here is that while for small IOs, the overhead of copying and still seeing, uh, as shown by the y-axis on the right, is more or less 8%. For large IOs, it can go up to as high as more than 50%. And so we expect performance for uh, large IOs uh, to improve significantly by offloading, copying, and sourcing. It, interestingly, in this figure, what we see is that there is a significant jump in the overhead of copying and sourcing somewhere around uh, 128 uh, IO depth. The reason is that in this size, the uh, workload exceeds the LLC size, and uh, as the cache is flashing, performance uh, degrades further, and copying and CLC becomes more expensive. Now, uh, an additional motivation for this work is uh, the auto filter processing introduced in the NVMe storage protocol. And uh, this uh, auto filter processing is particularly challenging to handle when using generic zero copy. Uh, in TCP. So uh, in NVMe, what could happen is that an initiator sends two read operations for, say, uh, a read into buffer A and a read into buffer B. And then the target will reorder the reads. Uh, for instance, if A is a small read and B is a large read, uh, parallelism would allow A to bypass B. And so the response for B would, be, would return first. Uh, and thereafter, if, uh, say, a generic zero copy solution tries to place responses in order, uh, we can have a problem where the response for A would 
uh, arrive in, into the buffers of B and vice versa. And so to overcome this problem, what we need is upper layer protocol awareness. Well, uh, the offloading uh, NIC would, would uh, be aware of uh, the responses and the identifiers and place payload in the, into the correct buffer. Um, okay, so next we're going to show how we offload uh, uh, CLC on transmit and how do we uh, do the offload on receive, starting from a high level overview and getting into the details as we go along. So in the baseline for transmit, what we have is that the application sending data would get the data uh, CLC as uh, the NVMe TCP PDU is being constructed and the CLC is placed at the trailer. Thereafter, TCP would segment the data and uh, add TCP headers, which are sent over uh, the network. Now, what we want to do with offload is we want to offload CLC, meaning that we want to move the CLC operation from the CPU down into the NIC. And as a result, what we have is that data uh, that is placed in the PDU does not have a CLC yet, so it's marked as zero here. And this CLC of zero is passed along down for all the layers. Uh, the buffer for the zeros and for the CLC is already available here, and it's useful for TCP as it can handle it and perform retransmissions, etc. And eventually, when uh, this buffer is sent to the NIC uh, to be transmitted to the wild, the NIC would fill the uh, trailer with the correct CLC for this PDU. So this is the idea of this offload. Uh, now on receive, we would like to offload both copy and CLC. And what happens is that uh, an incoming packet arrives from the network. It gets the made to the receive link, uh, processed by TCP, where uh, it's assembled in order. And finally, uh, when it arrives to NVMe TCP, uh, the protocol checks uh, in the uh, PDU header uh, the destination buffer where this data should reside and perform scoping and cell seeing uh, to that buffer. And eventually the, the data arrives at the application. And so what we would like to do in our offload is to combine DMA in copying and cell seeing and offload all of uh, the above. And what happens is uh, as follows. So when the uh, when packets arrive, the NIC would use its uh, layer 5 protocol, the NVBTCP protocol uh, knowledge to understand uh, which buffer uh, to write the data to and uh, write the data there uh, using DMA while calculating CLC. Obviously, packets do not need to include uh, the PDU handle. The NIC would uh, store the, the, the latest PDU that's being processed and it would be able to process and TCP segments as they arrive in order without uh, needing the PDU header on each and every one of them. Uh, but now as a result, when we do this, uh, we don't want to DMA data twice, we want to DMA it only once. So the, uh, the data goes into the destination buffer while the headers and the, the PDU header and trailer uh, still go to the NIC receive link. And so what we have here is in the NIC receive link, we, we have the headers and the trailer, but not the data. And uh, in the next slide, or in the next couple of slides, I'm going to explain how we overcome this problem. So just bear with me. Uh, so to seamlessly integrate uh, our CLC offload, we opted for an approach that's very similar to what we did with TLS. We, we use a new SKB bit called SKB DDP CLC. Uh, this SKB is very similar to the SKB decrypted bit in TLS uh, in the way that uh, SKB DDP CLC on transmit indicates that CLC offload is expected, while on receive it indicates that uh, uh, no CLC errors in the packet's uh, payload have occurred. Uh, and in a sense, it's very similar to how SKB decrypted uh, relates to the need to authenticate data on transmit it's set and it means data needs to be authenticated and on receive it's set if authentication succeeded and if uh, it's not set then software fallback needs to take place so the, the same ideas uh, are used here uh, for seal thing now for copying uh, 
For copying, the NIP driver builds SKBs of packets as they appear on the wire. So uh, the SKB would point to packet headers in the receive link, to storage protocol headers and travels also in the receive link, and the payload in the destination buffer. So for instance, in this figure, what we would have is uh, the driver would build an SKB uh, such that it points to the handles here on the uh, receive link for the received packet, but the received packet has no data. The data uh, was floated and DMA writer, uh, written into the application buffer here, uh, and our SKB uh, would point to that data that resides in this application buffer. Now, in this example, it's simplified. We, we show only uh, one data buffer, but there could be a number of those. And that's completely fine. The, the offload can handle it. Um, now, to perform the offload at the storage protocol layer, so uh, NVMe TCP, for instance, uh, we need to skip the copy. And the way we do this is that uh, at the storage layer, uh, the copy is skipped if uh, the, source, the uh, source of the buffer and the destination buffer are the same as would happen for an SKB that looks like this. Uh, a nice property of uh, uh, such a construction of an SKB is that uh, all uh, network stack utilities are completely uh, oblivious to the fact that we perform zero copy here or an offload uh, as TCP dump can inspect the data and it can uh, manipulate it. It would just operate over the data that's already offloaded and placed into application buffers. Um, now, th there are a few challenges that we needed to solve. For instance, uh, uh, when doing copy offload, we had to avoid uh, network stack copies of the data back into the SKB. Uh, for instance, we observed that SKB coalesce uh, copies data, uh, and in the case of the offload, it copied data from the destination buffer back to the SKB. And so to avoid it, we reuse the SKB DDP CLC bit to indicate that this SKB also uses DDP. Uh, please don't uh, copy data from it back into the SKB. Don't try to coalesce it specifically. Um, so this is one thing we had to do. And another thing that's uh, implied by, by the copy of that is that we need to map between destination pages and their identifiers. And we need to do that uh, before uh, receiving uh, and that's completely fine as uh, storage protocols, so RPC protocols, so we map the buffers before sending the request. And by the time the response arrives, the buffers are already configured and we have them. Uh, okay, so now we're going to look at uh, the offload from a hardware perspective. Uh, and from a hardware perspective, this offload uh, resembles very much the, the offload we had for TLS. Uh, so we have the following unique context. We have a static state and a dynamic state. Well, the static state is uh, uh, consists of the following uh, uh, parts. It's, it contains a mapping of capsule ID, which is a, a request identifier, and uh, the buffers, which are essentially pages, and uh, various details about the protocol and the message formatting. Well, the dynamic state uh, relates to per packet information, such as the next expected TCP sequence number, and where is this TCP sequence number in the message, what's the count message capsule ID, and the CLC state, of course. So what's important to remember is that the static state is usually global for the connection, while the dynamic state gets updated for each packet. So when we want to offload uh, on the transmit side, uh, and we want to offload data that's uh, in sequence, it's very simple since all we need to do is uh, say calculate the CLC. So we incrementally offload the data as, uh, as packets come along. So if we have you know, TCP packets one, two, and three, when TCP packet three arrives, the NIC has observed the data in one and two, it calculated the CLC, and when it observes packet three, it knows when to place it since it has the size, and it just places it in the correct field of the CLC. And so it continues with packet four and five and six, etc. Uh, the NIC updates the dynamic state as it goes along, and using the dynamic state, it can uh, place the correct, uh, correct data for the CLC. Now, for out of sequence packets, we have a problem since uh, we have the wrong dynamic state. Uh, and uh, uh, 
to, to perform the offload, we'll need to provide uh, the message prefix. So, for instance, here, if we, uh, let's say we already sent packets one to eight, and then packet five is being transmitted. And we want to offload the, the CLC, which is contained in packet five here, for instance. Uh, so, to perform this offload, what we need to do is we need to provide the hardware with the message prefix, with the prefix of the PDU that's marked in the dashed lines here. And this will essentially reset the dynamic state uh, to the beginning of the message, replay the data without sending it to the wire. And uh, finally, when sending TCP packet 5, the correct state is available in the dynamic state and the offload will take place successfully. Uh, to store this state, which we need for resynchronization, we'll use the TCP transmit buffer uh, and we uh, use the ACK handler uh, such that TCP would not release the PDU message data until the entire PDU is acknowledged. Uh, so just very similar to TLS in this. Um, now on the receive offload, uh, what we have is uh, that the NIC uh, uh, offloads uh, incrementally when packets arrive in order, and it's very simple. Uh, how will it the, the single bit? Is packet CLC okay? And if everything is okay, then everything is marked to green and all is good and software can skip CLC completion. Now, when we have a retransmission such as uh, number two here, that's being transmitted one, two, three, four, and then we see two again. So for two, we would not verify uh, anything at all. We wouldn't verify the data in two. Instead, we maintain the state in the NIC such that when packet five arrives, we can continue offloading. Uh, and if uh, for some reason the, the first number two is dropped in software and the second number two is uh, the actual data, then software fallback would kick in and calculate the uh, CLC of the corresponding PDU. Uh, now, when, when PDU data is the old old, then we can still continue offloading. So in this case, we had uh, packet one alive, and then instead of packet two, packet three is alive, and then packet four and five, and only later packet two is alive. So uh, we offloaded packet one since it was expected, but packet three was not expected and could not be offloaded since the NIC was missing the data of packet two. But nevertheless, as the NIC knows the length of the PDU here, it can skip to the next PDU when it receives packet free. And using this PDU, it can continue offloading uh, packet four and packet five. And then when it sees packet two, it's considered the same as a retransmission. And so that's skipped and packet six is, continue, is used to continue the offloading uh, without losing state. Now, the real problem is with the header reordering, uh, such as the case uh, here, where packet three, which contained a PDU header, uh, was reordered and received later. And as a result, the NIC stops offloading completely and it waits for software to recover the NIC context. Uh, and this problem is uh, particularly non trivial as uh, packets continue to arrive and uh, we would not like to stop uh, all software processing just to synchronize the NIC, so we need to somehow do it while handling traffic. And for this, we combine software and hardware. Uh, and so what we do here is that, uh, so let's consider the example we had before, packet freeze is reordered. So the first thing we do is that the, the NIC hardware speculatively finds a PDU message header using some header magic pattern. Uh, there are many of these, uh, and NVMe TCP also uh, has such a pattern. Uh, and then uh, when uh, a magic pattern is found, say in TCP packet five here, uh, the hardware asks software uh, whether this was indeed a, a PDU header. Uh, meanwhile, hardware continues to track uh, the next expected PDU header according to the length field uh, in, in the PDU header. And uh, eventually, software will respond that yes, it was a PDU header. And from that moment onward, we can resume offloading uh, based on the tracking and speculation that's now confirmed. Uh, and so this is how we recover from uh, 
offload uh, and reorder them. Uh, so now I'm going to hand off uh, the mic to Yolai, which will present uh, the APIs and the implementation in Linux. Uh, Yolai, the stage is yours. Hey, so our implementation to, our, to this offload, uh, we use the ULP DDP in infrastructure. ULP DDP infrastructure is a generic cross-layer infrastructure between NIC drivers and storage protocols. This infrastructure is protocol and vendor agnostic. The NIC drivers and ULP are unaware to each other and they only talk using ULP DDP inter interface. One protocol can work with different NIC drivers and NIC drivers can support different protocols using this interface. For example, ULP who can benefit from this infrastructure are NVMe over TCP and iSCSI. Both ULP and DDP drivers who want to use this interface needs to provide ULP DDP API abstract. In basic, ULP DDP API contains setup and teardown operation to create or destroy all contacts per connection. In addition, they have set setup and teardown DDP operation to map or unmap all contacts per IO request. And in addition, they have protocol resynchronization operation to resync hardware contacts over the out of order packets. Next. As mentioned, first user of ULP DDP are NVMe over TCP and Mellanox drivers. In our implementation, we start our DDP and data digest offload after all handshake complete, and it can start even after. For the DDP operation, before sending a read request, NVMe TCP use DDP setup op to request from MLX5 driver to set up the DDP interface and DMA map the buffers. When NVMe TCP done processing a received PDU, he will call DDP teardown to call the MLX5 driver to release the, to unmap the buffers. And then, uh, then because uh, the hardware, uh, it's, it might include hardware operation, MLX5 driver will in, indicate the, he finished handled the DDP teardown operation using an async teardown operation to the, UL, to the NVMe over TCP. Only then NVMe over TCP can complete the request and releases resources correlated to this I.O. As ULP, DDP is cross-layer interface between a net driver and ULP, ULP need to check if the net driver is supporting it. The common way to do so is using NetDev features field. NetDev feature field is 64-bit variable and each bit represents one feature, which make room for only 64 different features. But we run out of nether features bit as uh, all bits are already taken. And our proposal in this manner is a uh, override an unused feature bit to indicate if the net device uh, supports ULP DDP. This, this bit became unused uh, 10 years ago and seems it fits to be override to our cause. Let's talk about the future. So in the future, we want to integrate with TLS to have NVMe over TLS as protocol and accelerate it using our work. Data path uh, POC already working, uh, but a solution for the TLS handshake in NVMe over TCP is needed as the KTLS using user space library for TLS handshake and NVMe TCP layer is in kernel space. That's it, thank you for listening. Thank you all. All right. all right, we are back. And I'm picking up Echo, but uh, Boris, uh, yes, you're online. Do you want to add anything more? Uh, no, I'll take questions. So, uh, so it sounds like uh, I'm the only one who asked a question, so I'll just read mine and then uh, we'll see if that's the only one left. So my only question was, it looks like you guys are holding, and I understand why you're doing that, you're holding the PDU 
or rather the TCP retransmits till the PDU is acknowledged effectively, right? And, uh, but that is, you're now messing with the ACK responsiveness, right? Because you're not going to consider ACKs that have, could have freed buffers till the entire PDU has been traversed. Have you guys seen any problems with that in terms of fairness, in terms of liveliness of hacking? So no, we, we actually do similar things with TLS and in the scale of video, hopefully it's not an issue. Um, but I, I would be interested in hearing uh, any issues that can occur due to this. So we can makes, it makes sense if I understood what he just said. At 4K, maybe it's not that big a deal. I, I can believe that. The, like if you're talking about PDU sizes, the PDU size could be megabytes, right? So, well, well actually, no, you usually the stack limits those uh, to like 128K or 256. I see, okay, 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 makes sense. Anybody else? Any other questions? If not, well, thank you. It's clearly uh. A very important uh, area of work, and VMETCP is beginning to become a very important transport from a storage perspective. So, thank you for this offer. Thanks for listening. All right, I think that also concludes our day. The, the lounge is still open, tables are set up, Jamal is always available. Uh, so, somebody please stick around, say, say hi. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. Thank you for the patience from the audience. And we'll see you tomorrow.